This is the OTP presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. Plan on paying less for the coverage you need with Farm Bureau Health Plans. Get a quote today at FBHP.com. I'm Mike Keith. So glad to have you with us on this holiday and so glad to share a really great conversation with Titans great Blaine Bishop. We had an opportunity to do a Follow Me Through Tennessee episode where Blaine and I drove to Gallatin and visited Swainy Swifts on the Square. Now, if you haven't been there, you need to go. The burgers are fantastic. The desserts are outstanding. I recommend the Cookie Monster, maybe even for dinner alone. Just have the Cookie Monster. Anyway, we had a chance to talk in my Nissan truck on the way to Gallatin. Great conversation with number 23 himself. And so here is our OTP with Blaine Bishop. All right, let's talk Blaine Bishop. Let's talk football. Here's what I found most interesting about your career several years ago that I didn't know. So I'm at a University of North Carolina football game and I meet two of your teammates from Ball State. I don't, unfortunately I can't remember their names. <laughs> but they told me, they said, you know, Blaine did not start his career at Ball State. So you come out of Cathedral High School in Indianapolis, where was it you started your college career? Well, actually, that, that school is closed now. Okay. And I, yeah, I went to a Catholic high school, uh, naturally, as you mentioned, Cathedral. And uh, me and a couple other guys, since uh, we felt like we weren't getting recruited, uh, we're all good students. I was now the captain of the team. And uh, so we decided to go to St. Joseph's College in Rensselaer, Indiana. Rensselaer. Now, I know Rensselaer, yeah, Rensselaer because yeah. that is three exits down from where my wife is from. She's from Crown Point. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, Crown Point always had a great women's basketball program. Still do. Uh -huh. and, uh, and to be honest, I hadn't even uh, heard of Rensselaer until we started doing research because I was getting recruited by a lot of Division II, Division III. Uh, you know, walking on it, you know, uh, DePaul. DePaul, yeah, DePaul. I mean, I had all these kind of offers like that, yes. Uh, and uh, local schools there, Butler was uh, one of the final ones that, you know, that I was considering. And uh, so, yeah, I went to St. Joe's. I went there and uh, it all kind of worked out because, you know, that, that really hurt that I wasn't a Division One player. I thought I was capable and not a high profile. My dream was to go to Notre Dame. You go to Cathedral Fighting Irish, you want to go to Notre Dame. A lot of students went there, uh, not, maybe not players. Uh, but uh, so, I, you know, they told me I was too small. I could walk on and those things. So. I went to St. Joseph's and I, you know, I was, uh, you know, excited about the opportunity. Uh, I thought I'd have a great opportunity to play right away. And uh, so that was appealing to me. Uh, and it was an up and coming, you know, division two school that no one really knew and, you know, wanted to go there really as far as football, uh, but they had some good players. So uh, yeah, I decided to go to St. Joseph's College in Rensselaer, Indiana. It's cold. And, yeah, yeah. Oh, it was it was freezing. You get a touch of you know Chicago, a little bit of weather there as well. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting. Some of the guys, like, man, I just talked to him uh, about a month ago. He's the he's uh, Coach Bates. Coach Bates was the defensive coordinator there at St. Joseph's College. Guess where he's at now as a defensive coordinator? He's been there for a while too. No idea. University of Pittsburgh. No kidding. Yes, he was my DC. Huh, so he coaches for Pat, Dardu yeah, Pat uh, Narduzzi there. Narduzzi, yep, yep. yep. I met him down, uh, they were in Georgia, so I drove down and, and met him down there one time uh, during the camp time years ago. But, uh, yeah, so we, we've talked uh, you know, over the years. And, uh, yep, he was, that was his uh, one of his early career stops, which is kind of fascinating, isn't it? So how do you – what did you play at St. Joseph's? Were you a running back still? Well, when I went there, I made all state, all city, all metro at defensive back. So, and we had a three-headed monster. You know, we we're playing, uh, you know, power IT running back. So we all kind of blocked. You know, some of sometimes I was the tailback, sometimes I was the fullback, sometimes you know, or I was the motion guy. I was kind of the home run hit guy more so than the other guys. Uh, so I could go for five carries for 105 yards and never touch the ball again. Right. So. Uh, very true team-oriented type offense, and then I played defensive back, uh, corner. Uh, so uh, that's kind of how I grew. And then I, you know, I, I don't think I had enough carries really to 
be in a conversation of being one of the elite running backs, but my average yards per carry was really high. And I, in my heart and soul, I thought I was a running back. <laughs> we all no, no, no doubt. No, you know that was that era, right? So, uh, but I, one thing I didn't ever, you know, kind of dispute, in which I, you know, I always try to convey to on air or you know to kids is that you know opportunities is to play on both sides of the ball and you never know where you may get that right and even though my heart and soul was in a running back I was never thinking I, that's all I was going to do so I played defensive back when I first got there that was the intent when I got there and uh, I started um, there and they kind of had me at uh, safety because they had another they had a couple other guys that were uh, pro prospects uh, at corner I think the guy from Florida named Toombs Another kid, I can't remember his name, but and so I was there at uh, at, at safety, and I was being very productive. Uh, I was getting interceptions, blitz, and it was kind of came like my forte of doing multiple things, and I had cover skills because of playing corner. And I had a great, you know, I, I was a football guy. I was an instinctive player. Uh, so uh, there came a time when it was week four, and the two starting running backs were injured so going into the game they uh they only had two running backs left on the roster and I, so they said hey Blaine we're gonna have you teach you a couple plays you may get in the game maybe not hopefully it won't well the first play the starter got ankle sprain and then the uh second string guy I think uh wasn't as effective so they just put me out there a couple plays uh, while I was still starting on defense and then I end up having a, a really good game I scored two touchdowns as a running back uh, intercepted a pass for a uh, touchdown, and then uh, I think I returned a punt for a touchdown. Wow. And so after that, you know, I didn't think nothing of it. So after that game, and I can't even remember, I think we are playing uh, like Kentucky State or someone. I, I can't even remember who we were playing. But after the game, I'm coming out of the locker room, and these uh, two NFL scouts were there. Yeah, two NFL scouts, the Jets and the Giants. And they said, you got a shot at the National Football League. And I looked at them and thought they were, man. and I didn't even, I thought somebody was messing around. They said, no, and they had on their, you know, their golf shirts, you know, saying, you know, Jets and Giants. Mm -hmm. And they said they were there to watch some other guy on the other team, or, you know, or our prospects. And, and I was kind of still kind of stunned and like, oh, okay. Watch out. Vehicle on shoulder ahead. So, so I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah so, yeah, so at that point in time, I just, I never thought about it again until the season was over. So how do you get from there to Ball State? <laughs> well, that, that's, that's exactly what happened. So I went back to my high school coach, who was the president of the school, uh, Coach McGinley, and uh, asked him, sitting there, literally six months after you know, I wasn't recruited, really. Uh, I think I had Southern Illinois in Butler. That was kind of the bigger schools uh, at the time that I, I could have chose. I asked him, was I a Division One football player now? He said, absolutely. You know, I didn't. I wanted to say what changed, but I, I didn't, didn't that really change. It actually, it, it probably was great because I was working hard. And you know, when you're in high school, you're working hard, but then you ratchet it up to a whole nother level. Right. And you become obsessed with just working out and and kind of proving. I think that's where the hitman really started coming to life, really, because it it hurt me so bad because I, I would see other players and I, I really understood how good I was and how good I wasn't. You know, I, I, if somebody was better than me, and I was like, yeah, that guy, he's really good. And, uh, yeah, I don't know, we're about the same, uh, you know. And I got a confidence. Also, there was a kid we played against in high school, and he was a year behind us, but he went to Notre Dame on full scholarship. And I said, well, dang, I'm just as good as him. I'm, 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 we're the same size. So came back to him, you know, my coach there, uh, Mr. McGinley. And so he said, you can go to Indiana State, you know, program's not, not that good, you know. And he's at Ball State, uh, it's a good program, you know, you'll be fine there. You can start right away. Or you can go to IU, and you'll probably have to sit a year. And the rules are different there, so I was going to have to sit, but I, I was going to get to play after a year. I could practice, so they could use it as a red shirt, but that was the rules then. And so uh, he called Ball State. I said, well, call Ball State. And because uh, since he said I could start right away, so he called Ball State. Um, uh, the, the recruiting coordinator was uh, Coach Use Land, the right two lanes to and take uh, he called him and he said, "Yeah, sure, we'd love to have him uh, come on up." Because they had looked at me in the year I came out of high school, but they had already offered uh, two kids, and they actually ended up starting as true freshmen while I was at St. Joe. They went to Mail and Trinity in Kentucky, yeah, and which were powerhouse Great schools, yeah, yeah, powerhouse schools. So you know, yeah, and. Uh, so they had no more allotment 
because that's why they didn't offer me. So they said, we'd love to have him walk on and if he does what we think he can and after a semester, we'll, we'll see where we're at. And so that, that was huge for me because that's when I, I, I got a huge backing from uh, my family went to all my games. It was just kind of like a family deal. And, uh, you know, my mom said she'd give me a year and, and we'd see where we're at, you know, paying for school. So, uh, How long before you get a scholarship? Exit right to exit yeah. 95. So after practicing in, in the rules then, I couldn't play, but I just practiced every day. Uh, and they had me in multitude of positions. I was like the scout team guru. Where I, if there was an option quarterback, then I was the option quarterback. I might have been the receiver or the running back or uh, defensive back. Uh, so I would do all those things in practice. So after uh, the first semester, uh, they offered me a full scholarship. Wow. You know, so that was, that was pretty What was unique. that like? That was pretty cool because uh, I sat there with uh, Coach Avenue. Mentor. He was our DC, who kind of became a you know, bigger guy. You know, he left my senior year and went to Notre Dame DC. Rick Mentor. Rick Mentor. Yeah. Yes, and he, I think he was an interim head coach at Kentucky. He's been the head coach at Cincinnati. Yeah. Uh, his son now was head coach at Vandy. Now he's at uh, Michigan. And uh, when his son was here at Vandy a couple years ago, we used to meet for coffee there at Starbucks all the time. So I, you know, I'd keep in touch with all the guys who coached me, and gave me an opportunity. But he was. It, part of this was uh, him giving me confidence as well. So eventually I end up starting, and Mentor was the one who told me that, uh, hey, you're gonna compete to start at corner. And I, he said, what side of the ball do you wanna play? I said, man, my heart is always gonna be in offense. He says, well, I'm gonna tell you right now, you are uh, the third or fourth string running back on this team. And mind you, we had Bernie Pomley. Mm -hmm. Played for Miami. The Dolphins. And Corey Kroon, who was drafted in the fourth round yeah. by the Patriots. Who, yeah. You know, towards ACL, never really panned out. And so, and then there was another uh, kid there, and he said, you know, you're, you're probably not going to be playing that unless you're going to be, like, third down specialist guy right. or something. So I said, uh, so I'm, I can compete to start on, on, on uh, <laughs> a cornerback? He said, absolutely, you can compete to start. And I looked at Coach Manor, and this is when he looked at me, <laughs> and I said, this is, remember now, I'm, I'm going on 19. And I, did, I felt like I had nothing to lose. I said, so who am I competing with? <laughs> like, there is no competition. Because I had seen the guys, even though they started, and they were good players uh, and, and good people. Uh, uh, Keith Hackett, who is now a pastor, uh, he's in Louisville now, he moved to Indianapolis. And um, uh, Porter was the other guy's name. And Rick Minner said to me, he put his arm around me, said, don't worry about that. You just go be you, and we'll be fine. And so there was never really any competition. They moved guys around, and uh, actually it was really kind of Keith Hackett, who was the guy who I roomed with on the road, who traveled, really great human being. His dad actually is in the Hall of Fame, and his dad is pitch. He never told me this until literally like five years ago. His dad is the, one of the people that's the statue in front of Kentucky football. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, it's, it's, so it's whatever the Hackett guy is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I never knew that the whole entire time. So this guy has a you know a history of a success uh, in athleticism in his family, and uh, so yeah, that's kind of how it ballooned and uh, you know, started in making all Mac and everything else. The head coach there, Paul Shudell, was a Michigan disciple uh, from Boch Beckler. Um, so kind of was a run the ball. You know, we started throwing the ball a lot there towards my junior senior year, but. And we're defense forward, and we had some, some, you know, really good players. But uh, so yeah. you started at corner for three years. Yes, I was at corner. So you didn't play safety at all. I had never. Well, in high school, my senior year, halfway through, uh, the the safety got injured, and they moved me to safety because the other guy, he was a real good player, but he just couldn't. You know, he wasn't better than the other corner, but he was a really good player. So then they moved me to safety halfway through my senior year, and. Uh, Collins was his name, uh, was played corner. So that was really the only time I really played safety. Now, I was a hybrid at St. Joe, so I could say I did that there. But So it wasn't like it was uncomfortable, but I I really had no, you know, in high school, you're just running around and chasing the sure. I'm not, yeah. you know, I wasn't reading keys or anything like that. But uh, uh, so, yeah, I, I was really a cornerback. That was my background. So when – how many of the All-Star games did you play in? How much of did you go to Combine? How much of that did you do pre-draft? Well, it was kind of interesting because I, I didn't even know I was getting scouted like that until uh, my senior year. Okay. And they said 15 teams are here to watch you play in this game. And I was like, oh, man, dang, why didn't you tell me? You know, <laughs> They were like, well, I don't blame I don't think you would have played any different. 
and I, I was what they call the boundary corner. And at that time, most Watch boundary it. corners end up ahead. being safeties in the pros. Right. Uh, because you kind of blitz or run support, but to be on my and what we did there, I, I blitzed uh, Rick Minner's defense, which was really complex. And probably that's probably helped me when I got into 46 is learning all these defensive schemes because we had to wear cards on our wrist, everybody. Um, and, and all I did was play press man to man. I, you know, I could play off, but I would never wanted to do that. Uh, so that's kind of where I, I was I was a cornerback. So I didn't know I was going to get invited. So all my invites came after the season where I, I was at the Blue Gray, the Senior Bowl, and then the Combine. That all kind of happened right behind each other. It wasn't like going into my senior year, I knew I was going to do it, or right when the season was going on, or right when it ended. It didn't kind of balloon into that until right after the season was over. More of our conversation with Blaine Bishop coming up on the OTP, but I need to remind you that SeatGeek is the official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. Whether you're buying or selling tickets to Titans games or any other live event in Nashville, SeatGeek is the place to do it. SeatGeek, the new official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans, so Titans fans can fan. Now more of the OTP with Blaine Bishop. So did you know that you were going to be a safety in the pros? No. Okay. No, I did not. When I, did that? When did you find out that's what the expectation was for your career going forward? Or, or when was that determined? Well, I, when I got there, I was still a cornerback, and it was more I was going to be a nickel. And I, I, I thought I was doing really – I was. I was doing really good because I had great lateral quickness, and you could see uh, from, you know, my basketball days. So – and then I was strong for a guy my size. And so I was playing nickel, dime immediately there with the, and then the Houston Oilers. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had three safeties get injured, which was Mark Robb tore his ACL. Uh, then a, a first round or two years before that, Mike Dumas from IU, which I was a little familiar with, tore his Achilles. Uh, and then uh, uh, the backup, I forgot who the backup was. He had a torn patella tendon. Ugh. And so eventually it got to, and that all happened in, in training camp, my rookie year. So I'm, I still hadn't done safety. And so they they come to me wow. in a meeting during training camp and go, hey, well, you know, you're pretty sharp, you know, but we're going to probably move you to the safety in this defense. And we're trying to see if, you know, if that's something that you'd be interested in. And there, there's a huge part of me. I wanted to say no, but, <laughs> but, but it was like, oh, and so, you know, it's one of those kind of shocking, oh, really? Dang. Okay. And so I, I, I didn't even know what was at store here when I, in the 46, cause I didn't practice it or anything until, you know, halfway through training camp. And so, uh, then I'm, I'm playing safety and one day I'm in nine on seven with the, all the hogs and, uh, buddy Ryan pushing me from behind in there and telling me to get up in there and I'm because I'm still my mindset is a corner I may have been an aggressive corner but I, that's nothing like playing safety right. then playing half the time you're a linebacker uh you know and then you're a slot cover corner to then you're a big deep safety so yeah it took me the all the training camp to come to realization this is what I I'm going to be and, and that, that really really then brought the hitman out that that did it that it could because I couldn't have played and practice every day without having it. I mean, that I went 100 miles an hour every single day. You had no choice. Yeah, I had no choice. I, I really didn't. And uh, yeah, so I had to learn how to practice that way too because I didn't know how to practice without going 100% because, you know, Coach Fish, you know, was, there, sure. was like, hey, you're going you to slow down. You're going to not only hurt yourself, but you can hurt your teammates. So I, I had to figure that out too. But uh, that, was, that was after the fact, like after uh, Buddy Ryan left. What was your year like with Buddy Ryan as the defensive coordinator? That that was uh, being a rookie. That that was uh, intimidating <laughs> and it was scary. I, and I, there's no question. He called everybody by their number, so there was no, you know, hey, 58. And then you know, I got to play with Wilbur Marsh. He brought Wilbur Marshall from the 46. I remember watching Wilbur Marshall in grade school on oh, sure. the Bears because in Indianapolis we didn't have the Colts, so we had all Bears games. Sure. Uh, so I was well familiar with him and. Uh, and then all the guys, we had Sean Jones, William Fuller. We had what we called the freak then uh, was Lamar Latham. Mm -hmm. 57. Freak. Yeah, he was a freak of nature. He, yeah, he was he was fast for a big human being. Uh, so it was, it was a veteran team. Uh, and 
with a lot of experience. That was the year coming. My rookie year came off of them losing. A, I don't want to say 30 points they were winning by, and they lost the game in the playoffs to the Bills. Points. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, going in or going into training camp, um, you know, the late great, you know, Mr. Adams said that this is this, if we don't go to the Super Bowl, this team will be dismantled. Yes. So, uh, I, you know, I was a rookie, so I'm I'm baffled. Like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna get cut. <laughs> so I, I didn't know what was going on. I had no idea. You know, I'm I, I'm in Indiana. I, I I watched the owners, but I I didn't know where they were and what happened the year before. I, I mean, I I watched it in college. I was a senior, and I remember I turned the game and I turned it to I remember the Cowboys game, and I don't remember who the Cowboys were playing because it was a more competitive game. And then when I turned it back, it was fourth quarter, and I saw that they were losing. So. You know, it's funny because so I worked Sundays. And uh, I got off work and came home, and that game was on. And I turned it off at 28 to 3 and took a nap. Uh huh. And turned it back on, and it was, you know, 38 38. And it's like, what happened? Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, it, it was. So going into my rookie year, that was the follow. You know, I followed that up. So it was a. Uh, because they really fired intense. Jim Eddy and they hired Buddy Ryan to be the defensive coordinator. Yes, that is the history there. So, you know, my first go around with Buddy Ryan, I'll. I, I, I was nervous, scared, uh, everything involved in that with Buddy, because he was intimidating. Uh, and there was some adjustment there with some of the veteran players, uh, you know, with, with his approach. So I was sitting in the back and just prayed that he would never say my number. <laughs> so he just called you 23. Yeah, everybody, though. It wasn't just me. It right. was everybody, yeah. And he put the pointer. He had this, that, you know, the laser pointer, the red laser pointer. And I was like, oh, please do not point that thing at me. And, and you started uh, that year. Yeah, I, I eventually got to that uh, yeah, as a starter. And uh, I think that kind of – I had a really good game there and on Christmas Day as a, as a starter at safety. And uh, played a lot up to that point. But then eventually I started and uh, had a sack, Kyle's phone on Steve Young, and I kind of set the tone for my career. But, uh, yeah, that, that was uh, – I, I wouldn't have ever imagined I would have been playing safety and – in that defense and having the success, but to everyone's credit involved that, whether it was the scouting department, the coaching staff, Buddy Ryan and everything else, it fit every elite skill set that I had. Had to learn, you know, how to read defenses, I mean, the offensive linemen and, and how to fit, and then I was always strong, so I had, you know, I was squatting, you know, 400 and some pounds in, in college, so I was, he, he taught me how to use my power and even going against the guys that were bigger than me in 6'5", 300, and how to come with all these different moves. Uh, coach Bettis uh, was my DB coach, and he was an older gentleman and taught me a lot of different things, how to uh, not take the brunt of blows when I had to be inside the box. When did you become known as the hitman? Well, I started that my senior year in high, uh, college. Really? Yes. And so I had a Letterman Jack with Hitman on there. and Because of started... Brett the Hitman Hart? Uh, no, it was not. But I was a big wrestling fan. Okay. All right. So, no, I, uh, someone um, on the team, I can't remember, uh, I think it was Henry Hall, uh, my teammate and he's an executive now on his own company, he, uh, he's the one to start calling me Hitman because I guess I was aggressive for a corner uh, and they had never seen anything like that in it was really just a habit. I, that that really created the hitman, the chip on the shoulder, yeah. all those things of maturation of my journey, my journey to to where I was then, and it kind of just evolved and snowballed. Uh, but I, I had to let him jack. You know, they gave a letterman jack, and I put hitman on the back, and I my senior I had it on there, and, and it kind of started it. And I started, uh, you know, really buying into it. That's so that's where it all started. Yeah. So your your whole thing though. I mean, you think about undersized high school, not recruited, end uh -huh. up at St. Joseph's, mm -hmm. walk on at Ball State, have to sit a year. Mm -hmm. You play all these different positions. Mm -hmm. When it is said things happen for a reason, mm -hmm. that that's 100% right because there is seemingly no way that you have the career that you ended up having if you don't go through all those various experiences, okay. the slights, yeah. uh -huh. which provided yeah. the motivation, but also the understanding of different positions, positions. Uh -huh. being coached by different people, people. in different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, really quite an amazing journey 
that is not typical of the five-star safety who gets recruited, plays three years, and then is the eighth pick in the draft, and right. he's 6'3", 210, and runs 4'4", and completely different. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I, I, I don't know if I even would have turned into that player if I hadn't gone through the – you know, not understanding that at the time. Oh, sure. Uh, for sure. Uh, but, uh, man, I, I thought my journey, I was well prepared uh, for when I got the opportunity to, and I and I was just as surprised as everyone else. But as things kept going along, you know, even Rick Minner, once he left me my senior year and was at Notre Dame, and he's coaching, you know, Notre Dame. He said, "Hey, man," he calls me after the season, and says, "We have his kids going first round." That's what they're saying, and so he is. And he said he's athletic, and it was Tom Carter. Yeah, he went Tom to, Carter, uh, went twenty-five. To, Tom yeah, Carter. Yeah, well, I remember the, him well. And went to the Bengals, right? Yes. Yeah. And so he says, I think you're just as good as this kid. You were better. Yeah. <laughs> and so, well, I ended up being a safety. But, but he says, you know, he may be a little looser in his hips or maybe a tad faster. Or, well, you know, he said, but I want you to come down and work out with him. So I came down and work and that, that kind of start spewing the confidence level that I could compete. You know, because back then, all games were just on TV. Right. So we were just watching games on TV. So, I, you know, I'm looking up to, you know, whether it was guys in Notre Dame, Michigan, Ohio State, or Tennessee, or all the SEC schools. You're just watching the team and say, man, dang, I don't know if I could really compete on the same field with them. So that kind of built with me playing in the blue-gray. And that's, you know, that's where I meet Trent Green, who went to IU, which we played against. But then, you know, developing a relationship. Uh, with these guys and then I'm out there performing against these guys that went to Oklahoma in the blue gray or anybody you know and it's just start saying oh man I'm just as good as I said I was a realist about who I was if somebody was better if it was a time like oh, I don't know we about to say and so that happened and the senior bowl was just off the charts I mean that that really really put me in, in a mind frame and that was when uh, Alabama won the national title and all their players were in this game and practice every day, and we were doing two Because they were the 92 national championship. champions, mm -hmm. and they had some serious DBs, George yes, Teague. Teague. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's Ooh. where I met George Teague. Uh-huh. And developed a relationship with him. He could play. Yeah, yeah. And he was a first, he ended up being a first-round pick by Green Bay, right? The last pick or second, early right. second round. Yeah. So, so. And he was—he was—he was, he was, he was uh, what you know—he was built up to be, uh, but he ended up playing safety. Approaching a railroad just like so, just like he did. So he—he he, he would only practice, wanted to practice. So I was doing extra duty, so because I was on the same side as him as far as uh, uh, DBs, and so uh, I put in the work and uh, going against Quadri Ishmael. Oh yeah, and the missile, these, right? The missile. So and all these different guys, and, and the missile had me running to the goalposts. Uh, I was running so fast I couldn't stop. It's probably the fastest I ever ran in my life. <laughs> but uh, so it, th those things all happened, and it, it built really confidence in what I could do. And then going to the combine, seeing how I matched up uh, there, and you know, it may have been where they saw, well, this guy's a really good football player, but it's not quite as fast as he needs to be because I only ran like a four or five. I never ran a four or five. I always ran a four or four something. But uh, at the combine, I ran for something, you know, four, five, four, or something, and I was perturbed. I was like, "Oh, that's it's that did it for me. I'm, I'm not, I'm not gonna get drafted higher, uh, you know, than I thought." Because I was a middle round guy at that time. That's what they were saying. And uh, you went in a round that no longer exists. But the pick does. 214. 214. 214. Same pick as uh, Cortland. Yeah. Do, yeah. Do you, uh, do you keep up with who number 214 is every year in the draft now? Do you always look to see who it is? Or? Absolutely. I, I, well, I always look and I just see just to see who's still around, whether it's 230, 214, just to because there's really good players that are getting drafted. Now it's really hard to get drafted on so many really good players. Uh, so, yeah, I kind of always watch and pay attention. That is my dream is to – I have one dream left. I've kind of lived a dream of dreams in my life. Uh, being a broadcaster, that's what I wanted to be, meeting uh, Brian Gumble growing up, and he was a keynote speaker at this, uh, when I got this award for Youth uh, the Year for the Boys and Girls Club. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so I, I met him, and I kind of started the pendulum, and that's why at Ball State, I was part of the David Letterman building, yeah. and all those things, and communication, so I won, I didn't know I was going to make pro, I wasn't that guy like that, I thought, oh man, finally, I thought, oh man, I got a shot, but I, I didn't know I was going to make it, like, there was a part of me like, hey, I'm going to give it all I got. And if I don't make it, I'm cool with that. Mm -hmm. I, I really was. And uh, I had a job at, at State Farm coming out of college. State Farm in Richmond, Indiana. So you 
You were going to be Jake. <laughs> yeah. Wearing the khakis. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a heck of a Jake ride. from State Farm. Far. You would have been Blaine from State I Farm. I don't know if I would have been Blaine, but it might have been State You would have been Blaine from State know. Farm. I don't know, man. So it was it was a, wow, what a heck of a. It's been a ride. Yeah, it, it and then you been. get the, the whole thing happens. So you're, so you become a staple of the Houston Oilers. Mm -hmm. yeah, right and there. then you're a staple of the Tennessee Oilers. And then you're a staple of the Tennessee Titans. You're one of only 20 who can say that you were all three. Oh, is those 20 of us? 20 guys who wow. can say, I was a I Houston Oiler, I was a Tennessee Oiler, and I was a Tennessee, Tennessee Titan. Titan. Dang. Right. Okay. So so who are the names I would Oh, uh, I mean, you can know all three Eddie. Right now, I know Eddie. And Steve, Mac, Brad, Matt. Yeah, I mean, Bruce, it's. The, yeah, okay. But then there's some guys, too, that, that I wouldn't That are kind of. Jason Lehman. Oh, I would have never guessed that. Jason Lehman was, yeah. was one who was, uh, he was a Houston Oiler, he was a Tennessee Oiler, and then he was a Tennessee Titan. Um, hmm. Yeah, kind of a kind of a different deal, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, you can talk about, even on draft day, it was another, you know, disappointing day. And, and by the way. Where I, were you? I was in my apartment there with my two roommates, that's it. That's it. This is, remember, my one roommate who I went to high school with was the kicker and the punter, Damon Keller, and the other one was on the golf team, Jeff Kotner. Okay. And so uh, eventually it became just me. So it wasn't like big family gathering? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I never I never bought it. I, I, you know, I was a really focused person. After the fifth round, I did not watch. I went to the library. I called it Cracking with the Bracken Library. It was a three-level uh, library there on campus and I went to the library because I had a, I had a test on Monday and I said I think I better pass this test as I haven't got drafted yet because <laughs> so, you, you may be going to work for State Farm but, yeah that, that's exactly what I was thinking <clears throat> so so I, I did have a, a flip phone in the in the Mr. Holovac the great Mr. Holovac called me and then Floyd Reese and those guys and we're going to take you and I said, yeah, you guys called earlier in the fifth, but I didn't say you're gonna take me, but y'all acted as though y'all were, and then it didn't happen. I said, I'm at the library right now. They said, no, no, we're taking you. Just you gotta. And I go, I don't, I don't, I'm up here studying for this test. And they're like, no, no. Well, when you get back home, just go look at the ticker. We're gonna be on there. And so, meanwhile, so now I'm, I'm distracted. I can't study. So I get up, leave, and, and go home. My agent then is calling me. By the way, I'm driving back and said, hey, they took you. And so then I, until I sit there and I'm sitting on the couch by myself now, nobody's there, you know, because I left, they left. And uh, I saw my name and I, I, was, I was excited. I, okay. I was truly pumped. How much was your bonus? My sign-up bonus my rookie year uh, was uh, $20,000. <laughs> That's why I laughed. $20,000 and my salary, and since I was a late round pick like that, I only got a two year deal and I made 115 and then I think 125. But I mean, in 1993, that's good money, man. <laughs> that is really yeah, good money. So after taxes, I think it was my $10,000. So what, $11, what did you do with the bonus? Did you do any? Did you put it in the bank, or did you buy something? Or uh, no, I didn't do anything with the money. I kept the money. I didn't have a car in, until after the, my first year was up. No kid. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I, I. He says I didn't, but I did. Brad Hopkins, who was first round pick, we developed a relationship, and I was real cool with the Illinois guys because we had two guys from my high school okay. who went there. They were already graduating. They got drafted too. Derek Bronlow the year before me. Uh, fifth round, I think, by the Cowboys linebacker. And Mo Gardner, two years before that, who I played with as well, went to the Falcons in the third round. Okay. You've arrived. And so it was a natural right. connection, and we were at mid in a Midwest you know area. So I got to know B-Hop at the Senior Bowl. And so when we got drafted, he was the first round. I was the last round pick. And uh, I, I just stayed with him. He stayed in a, you know, a, a town home there right across the street from uh, <laughs> the practice facility. So... Uh, yeah, so I, I lived with him and I paid him a, a stipend like, you know, $500 or something a, a That's month. That's funny. Yeah, and then uh, I didn't buy a car, so I would drive one of his cars if I needed a car. I would have to ask him, but yeah, he had, a, you know, two or three cars. So I just, he's a car guy. Yeah, yeah, he's a oh, car yeah, guy. Yeah, 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 and, yeah. you know, he was first round. I think he had signed a bonus of three for me. I don't know what it was, but. And so I did that entire first season because I was still worried about that. I didn't know if I was going to make the team. That's where my mind Blank. still was at. No, that no. was thirty years ago, and, and I still had that mindset, and, and it actually motivated me. I, I never took anything for granted. Yeah, I, I never did. 
I, I, I just like I got to keep working, keep grinding, and because there was a part of me like I didn't know after this year even if I was going to be on the team. So even after my rookie year, I did an internship at Smith Barney down in downtown Houston, and they helped me facilitate that. They had a program there for the players uh, because I was concerned. I said, "Well, let me see if I can work at the corporate, and if I ever do get a nice contract, that I'd like to at least know what to do with it." And so I did that and still concerned that, okay, I'm, I may not be on the team the next year. Uh, you know, it just, if, and I think some guys, being that I was a later round pick, it benefited me where some guys maybe in the first round probably would have relaxed and took things for granted. And it, it never dawned on me. I was always trying to evolve and be the better version of what I was the year before. Right. And work on all my weaknesses and address them where a lot of athletes, they don't kind of address you know, if they're weak in, you know, whether, oh, I can't catch, you know, so I'm gonna work on my hands or my footwork, my covering skills. So uh, that's, that's kind of wow. where we were. So that was, it was, it was. That is a great story. That's my conversation with Blaine Bishop as part of our Follow Me Through Tennessee series as we went to Swainy Swifts on the Square in Gallatin. And remind you that Duncan has it where it's always game on. That's right. Grab a cup of coffee and kick off the action, whether that's drinking a cup on your way to the game or grabbing one to go before watching the game at home. Duncan is always there to help you get your game on. Just like the pros, we need to be at our best come game time, which is why Duncan is the most important part of your game day ritual, because it's always the best call for football. America runs on Duncan. Thanks for joining us for this special edition of the OTP. Tonight.